So I've been a little under the weather the last few days. <clears throat> so please forgive me if I act like I've been a little bit under the weather, because I'm still under the weather. I will tell you, though, that uh, today it took a turn for the better, because now I really feel like I'm super sick. I'm really ill, you know, as opposed to, gee, I wonder what all of this stuff is about, which was what was going on earlier. Share with you eating lunch, something that I don't want to put on the internet. But last night, um, but it's been a challenging week, and now I just feel sick. Whereas the rest of the time, I just felt like LHG whiz. What the heck's going on here? So that's why I have water here. I've avoided taking cough syrup simply because I've avoided taking cough syrup. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, this whole practice and thing we do with Zen, when we're dealing with a teacher, you know, if there's no teacher around, it's a very simple process. You know, we just uh, pay attention a lot. And that works out pretty good. The problem with that is that my uh, first teacher used to say that if you practice alone, eventually you become very bigoted. And I took that home and chewed on it for a while, trying to figure out what did he mean by that? Very bigoted. Um, you know, and I, I, I actually got Webster's out and looked up bigotry, which is an unfounded belief, right? I mean, I think everybody would agree that any bigot really can't defend what they believe. And so I kind of went back with that. This was very intelligent, this fellow guy. He was a very intelligent guy. He used words like that. So I started to realize what he was talking about. Now, I've always advocated that the practice of Zen is not a discussion group. And I'm becoming very aware of the fact that across America today, because Buddhism is a presence, that there are many places where the practice of Buddhism, I won't necessarily say Zen, although I'm sure Zen falls into this, that really what they have in their discussion groups. You know? But we had them in the old days too. But that's really not what the practice is. I mean go out in the morning and it's about 60 degrees and the wind is blowing lightly and, and the sun is reflecting off the green leaves in the tree, what's to discuss? You know, think about that. Yeah, I don't think there's anything to discuss. And if you go to a friend's house and their child, their new child, <clears throat> I have a friend we just had a baby. We won't see the baby until next month, William. But he uh, he's a young, well, he's in his 40s. He's a teacher. And uh, he and his wife just had a baby. And I'm sure at some point I'm going to see this baby. And I'm going to get to experience this baby. And babies are, are really Buddhas that aren't confused. They don't get confused <laughs> until, yeah, until you start telling them stuff. So uh, anytime you can spend time in the presence of babies that haven't been defiled, you can learn a lot. But there is absolutely nothing to discuss. There is just the experience of the baby. So I, today, I, I don't talk about this particular uh, uh, priest or monk. Uh, her name was uh, Hugh Kennett, and uh, Kennett, G.U. Kennett. And she was an English woman, and uh, years ago I read her book. She wrote probably the first book to describe ceremonies within the Soto School of Zen. And at the time I thought, this is an extraordinary book. The first thing that crossed my mind is, why would anybody even buy a book like this? Because you'd go in there and it would talk about the ceremony for Buddha's birthday, like we just did. And it would talk about what to do. And then it had the ceremony for a new abbot. When the new abbot arrived at the temple, you know, you everybody went out to escort him and he had a staff and somebody rang a bell. 
why would anybody care about that? I mean, honestly, that's what I thought to myself. I said I, I understood uh, an awful lot of things, like three pillars of Zen. You know, we did that as a class here a couple of years ago. I perfectly understand why somebody would go buy that book. Gosh, she just talks about all kinds of stuff and shares experiences. But here's Kent writing a book about basically the life of a priest and then giving some insights into that ceremonies and stuff. Years later, when I didn't quite know what to do for certain ceremonies, I would look at her book. And sometimes I could just take the ceremony just as it was in the book and use it, and sometimes I could tweak it a little bit. But I, I still don't understand why it's a popular book. I don't understand why somebody says, well, gee, I think I'll, I'll learn about Buddhism. I'll buy a Siddhartha. I'll buy three pillars of Zen. Look, I'll buy this book that tells you how to do ceremonies. Makes no sense. Well, Kenneth later uh, decided that she was going to write uh, basically a diary. And she did it in three books. And a friend of mine and I took turns buying the books. And one would buy the book and read it and then pass it along. And the other one, so that we didn't have to buy all the books. And this thing of confusion that takes place within the practice of Buddhism, within the practice of Zen, and within uh, just simply the practice uh, became very evident because I have to tell you about Kenneth a little bit. Kenneth was an English woman and she studied church music. Now, if you don't know, church music at Oxford is the Church of England. And ultimately, it is the High Church of England, which for those of you that have ever been in a Catholic church, that's exactly what it looks like. My uh, stepfather is from England, and he went to the High Church, because they have a low church, kind of like Methodists. Now, they don't have anything like Baptists. It's kind of like Methodists. But the High Church, they say Mass, and they wear, you know, the robes, and uh, they do the wonderful singing and Latin and all that stuff. And she learned all that, got a bachelor's degree. And then for some unknown reason, I think she went by uh, one of the English Buddhist societies and she got introduced to Buddhism, maybe by Christmas Humphreys, and she decided to go uh, to Japan. And, and I believe, if I remember this a long time now, guys, we're, we're talking 40 plus years, I believe the months that she went to stay with had come to England to give some lectures and said to her offhand, well, if you're ever in Japan, now this is a, this is the one that always gets me. I have students and I have friends. Well, I went to Vietnamese monk. I had this one student, he was going to come down to California and then he was going to come down to California and then he was going to come down to California and then he called me the other day and said, well, I can't come because I don't have any money. Oh, okay. But originally he told me that he needed to come down here because this abbot had invited him to talk to the temple. All the way from way over there to come down here. <clears throat> and he says that he had five other temples that he had to give talks at. I, I don't know if you've ever met people that spend a lot of time being polite when they say, we ought to come over to the house sometime for dinner. Do they really mean that well? Or they're just being nice sometimes. Sometimes they do, yeah. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they're just being nice. And it, it takes a lot of social skill to figure out what's what. Um, and, but I can tell you right now, I've been in a lot of temples, and they will invariably say, oh, please come back. And, oh, it'd be wonderful if you could come and give a talk. And, you know, all this. Remember my little fiasco of going to Las Vegas? I thought I was having to commit to twice a month, but it turned out I didn't. Uh, that was my misunderstanding because I took things at face value, and you have to remember that sometimes it doesn't come out that way. So, Kenneth decides she's going to go to Japan, and she writes this show and said, I'd like to come to Japan and study as a monk. I don't know how she made this leap to monk. She doesn't go into that, or if she does, I don't remember. But she stopped in 
uh, Singapore. And while she was in Singapore, this Chinese monk ordained her and gave her all five fancy kinds of clothes. And I've seen this happen with other people. I've seen this happen with Americans. They get all these fancy clothes, you know, hats, staffs, things you shake and they make noise. They got fancy robes, you know, and they've been a monk an hour and a half. And they come out of there and they think, I'm a really important person. And I don't know how that confusion happens. Now, if it was with the Tibetans, of course, you know, the Tibetans, and I go, oh, well, that's a 467 tool cube of, of, of bomb. And uh, we found him. And so, yeah, he gets to do all of that. Even though he doesn't know anything, he is, he is definitely a reincarnation of a great teacher. And by the time we get done with him, he'll remember all the stuff he used to teach. But I think that happens once in a blue moon. So she gets to Japan and she goes in. And she's got all this fancy stuff, red robes and yellow robes, stuff. And she meets this master who's quite old, who she'd met before, and says, I'm here uh, to study with you. And he said, great. And so he says, well, so-and-so over there is going to find you a black robe. So-and-so will show you how to put a kimono on. And within Sojiji, that was the temple she was staying in. Sojiji is a very large monastery with multiple temples in it. They had a woman's temple. They said, you'll be staying at this temple, but you will be working directly with me on your practice. So she writes about that experience. The first thing she wrote was, who am I? Am I the very reverend so-and-so, so-and-so that had this big ceremony? And this was a very honest query. Big ceremony in, in Singapore, or I am, am I a beginner? Now, this woman's got a college degree. But I'll bet you I could go into Lucerne Valley and stand at the market and ask people, and almost everybody would say, you're nobody because you don't know anything. The fact that you got all this stuff doesn't mean that you know anything. But she was confused because maybe she came from a background where stuff meant something. So a little time goes by and some Americans arrive. Now, Sojiji is, is really big monastery. And if I've got it right, they have the largest meditation hall in the world. They can put more people in that meditation hall than any other temple. That's pretty big. So these two Americans show up, tourists, <clears throat> and the master calls for her to come in and she comes in. And she's learned how to be the dutiful disciple by this time. And he uh, He's not very happy with these Americans because they're rude. And they don't realize they're rude, you know. They just kind of, you know, like the ugly American, remember that book a thousand years ago, talked about how rude we were because we didn't know other people's customs, which is basically what it was. And the British set the tone for us because, you know, their basic approach to the world was if you don't know British customs, you're a barbarian, so how could I insult you? So there's a practice, and I think I've used it twice and gave up on it as a total waste of time. And the practice is when somebody's doing something really outrageous and you want to point it out, and remember in the East they have this concept of face. We don't want people to be embarrassed. So somehow we have to tell them that they're making a mess of things without embarrassing them. So the way the Soto did it, very common practice was called mirroring. It's like you look in a mirror. Okay, so what they what the teacher started doing is he started chewing her out because she was rude. And he chewed her out for the different things that she had done. Now everything he, she was getting chewed out for was what these people had done. But you know the ego is a marvelous thing that manages to realize that that person did something wrong, but not me. And the whole time this is going on, according to her account, she was trying to give hand signals to the master that this isn't going to work, they're not going to understand. And of course they didn't understand. When they got all done, they thought they had been witness uh, a very poor, a 
American student getting chewed out for being rude. Never crossed their mind that what was being showed them was their rudeness. <clears throat> that kind of confusion happens all the time. It happens in everyday life and it happens in Zen. And the thing about the practice is that there isn't a right or wrong. That's never the issue. The issue is, can I get you to stop for a second and see? It's not about being right or wrong. If you think, you see, I, I, was, I looked at Merton. Uh, we have some birthday cake, and I have a little book that I was given by a friend that she purchased, uh, according to the description, uh, 28 years ago. And she handed it to me, wrapped in birthday paper, and said, okay, I'm giving this to you because I've never been able to finish it. And I, and I thought she, I really thought she was giving me something else. I thought she was giving me a brief history of time because I've never met anybody that finished it. <laughs> but yeah, but I opened it and there it was. Thomas Merton's uh, Zen and the Birds of Appetite. And I started reading it and golly gee whiz, that was wonderful because when I tried to read it, I was probably 30, 32. And I couldn't get past the first chapter. It just, I just figured he was so intellectual that I, I couldn't grasp it. Well, Thomas Merton was brilliant, and the problem with brilliant people is they sometimes really aren't that clear of those dummies. And uh, I started reading it now with a little experience. And I went, oh, and one of the first things he said is Zen has nothing to do with religion. And I think people get confused. See, I've always known that. Buddhism has to do with religion, and Christianity has to do with religion. And Islam, whether we agree with their, the way they do things, has to do with religion. But Zen doesn't have really anything to do with religion. It has to do with the world as it is and what you see. Now, if that helps you work better within your religion, that's great. And the first chapter, that was Thomas Merton's point. And Thomas Merton, if you don't know who I'm talking about, was a uh, Trappist monk. He was also a priest. When Trappists need priests, they ordain them. So he was Father Merton. But he was only Father Merton when he was doing what priests do, and the rest of the time, he was Brother Merton. And he felt that there was something missing within Catholicism. And what he felt was missing was a meditation practice. And if you've ever done any reading about Catholic meditation, it's horrible. They have got the worst. Oh, it's just, it's agony. It's painful. It's, uh, uh. And so he brought some Zen masters in to teach the monks at Gethsemane, which was his monastery that he lived at in Kentucky how to do our meditation. And they were very successful. And it's, there a movement began within Catholicism to do our kind of meditation. Not, not to change their religion, because Zen is not a religion. Zen is a way to approach life. So it worked out just fine. I always get to think it's so funny, people get confused. Can you be a Christian and, and a Zen Buddhist? Well, see, Merton would say, just leave the Buddha stuff. Can you be a Catholic or a Christian or a Baptist or whatever, and a Zen practitioner? Of course. Every Zen center has a Jew except us. I keep waiting for our Jew to show up. I don't understand why we don't have a Jew here. Well, wait a minute, Stephanie was a Jew. Yeah, we did have a Jew for quite a while. So it is about doctrine. It's about what you believe and what you don't believe. And the reality is, is whether you believe in God or not doesn't change anything. And that's very hard for some people to accept because they think they have to believe in God or what happens. I don't know. I down <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 one of my favorite authors talks about he wrote a book called Small Gods. And in that book, there was a tortoise god. 
It was a tortoise. It wasn't like a tortoise god, you know, like they had in Hindu. It was just a tortoise. It was wandering across the desert, hoping to find someone else to believe in him because he only had one person who believed in him. And when that person stopped believing, he would disappear. And this was Terry Pratchett. Last year passed away. So, but what really happens if we don't believe these things that are in the religions? Does it change our reality? Does it change what's there? Well, the Zen person would say, no, it doesn't change anything. The river still runs. The trees still blow in the breeze. Flowers fall. Birds fall out of the sky. All of these things continue to happen. It has nothing to do with what we believe. Now, if you think it has to do with what you believe, then you believe in the great illusion. Because now you're going to say, well, what I see is what is. Well, 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 well we know better than that. We know that the, the worst evidence in the world, right, Counselor? The worst evidence in the world is what people think they saw. Six people see six different things. So that's not, that's not very validating to, to see that. But if I stub my toe in the night uh, on a rock, I know I stubbed my toe on a rock at night when it was dark. And I may not even know what I stubbed my toe on. I have to reach down and I find a rock and okay, everything clicks together. So, case number 40 in the gateless gate, for anyone that's keeping track of this, which nobody is, and I'm sorry, but it's, I got to find a book that has people's real names in it. None of these people had Japanese names, but that's what they've got in here. When Isan, the priest, was with Hakujo, he was Tenzo, the cook, or head cook of the monastery. Hakujo wanted to choose a master from Mount Tai. So he called together all the monks and told them that anyone who could answer his question in an outstanding manner would be chosen. Then he took a water bottle and stood it on the floor and said, you may not call this a water bottle. What do you call it? The head monk said, it cannot be called a stump. Now, this takes us back to the sixth patriarch and how he became the sixth patriarch. Because all the monks were asked to write a poem but the only monk other than the head monk that wrote a poem was the Sixth Patriarch, who was a layman working in the kitchen. Okay? He wasn't even a monk. And the head monk wrote a poem because, of course, the head monk is normally the number, that's number two over there. Okay? I get run over by a tractor-trailer unit, and then you just go get him, and he takes over. But, <coughs> so there's an assumption in this is the Dharma successor. And it's nice, that isn't always the way it works. You know, there's this sort of legality in the world, but in, the reality is if the master's not dead, he might pick somebody else. But the head monk said it cannot be called a stump. And that wasn't a bad answer, it just wasn't a good answer. And Hakujo asked Isan his opinion. Isan tipped over the water bottle with his feet and went out. Hakujo laughed and said, the head monk loses. And Isan was named the founder of the new monastery. Muman, who put together the gateless gate, made a comment on every one of the stories within it. And his comment was, Isan displayed great spirit in his action, but he could not cut himself free from Hakujo's apron string. He preferred the heavier task to the lighter one. Why was he like that, eh? He took off his headband to bear the iron yoke. So there's an old Vietnamese koan that the student comes to the master and says, what is the way? And the master says, the plum tree in the court. 
does that. Same answer could be the rock you stubbed your toe on. Or a much more enlightened view 